to do it uh, by instead of PowerPoint by using a board. But this is uh, more than enough for what I need. Most of the time, I use nothing. Thank you very, very much, um, uh, Satosh, for that kind introduction. I was chatting with Uma yesterday about your institute, and thank you to all of you. I don't know who are the people behind the, the plan to invite me, but Amrita was corresponding with me, Parikshit, whoever it was, thank you very much. For me to uh, come to an academic place and give a lecture always feels very special. Uh, I was last week in Ashoka and I was complaining that I get a lot of invitations from India to talk, but always the topic is the same, prospects of the Indian economy. And there's a limit to how many times you can talk about the prospects of the Indian economy. And given that it's just so full of doubts, I mean, who knows what the prospects are. So coming to an academic place, I decided I'll take advantage of that and give you a talk uh, on based on what I'm currently researching on uh, most of my time. Over the last roughly two and a half years, I will give you a glimpse of some words which have come out last year and some uh, one which is yet to come out. So once again, just thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I enjoy this and it's a pleasure for me to be here. The concern that I'm going to uh, talk about is, is to do with group moral behavior and the need for agreements and conventions in advance. But before that, since your director was talking about ISER and science, as he was speaking, I was remembering um, that there is an interface, a big interface between economics and science. Economics is a very broad discipline, as you know. There are some ends of it which are like humanities. You write in plain English language, even game theorists like uh, Thomas Schelling would not write a single equation, but just clear thinking and literary work. And the other end, there is, of course, completely axiomatic theoretical work. Gerard Debreu is probably the extreme of it. And when when Uma was talking about science, I was remembering one of the early economists who died completely unknown. In fact, in the community of economists, uh, they didn't even know whether he was still alive or not. This is a German economist called Hermann Heinrich Gossen. He had anticipated many of the ideas which would later be discovered by Stanley Jevons, by Leon Walras and later Marshall and all, it was there in uh, Gossen's work. Gossen had this beautiful line in this work which died unknown during his lifetime it would be discovered later. He was a sad, tragic character, full of pomposity about his intellectual capacity, but realized that no one was recognizing. In the introduction of the book, he says, I will do for the human sciences what Copernicus did for the stars. So he was reaching out and at one level, staring at the world which Adam Smith was doing and trying to understand what's going on and getting a little bit of understanding of this very, very strange world. And you think for a moment, you step back and you look at trade going on, people producing goods which they won't use themselves for someone else, you wonder, is there a directive coming from the top? And it was at that point of time, a dramatic breakthrough, 1776, for Adam Smith, saying, no, you don't need any central direction for this. It is possible. We can't overdo it. That will happen always under all circumstances. It is possible that individuals going about their <coughs> own chores can bring about a certain order. This is the invisible hand. The invisible hand is descriptively written, overused, misused a lot. But, and to sort of understand that that will work under certain conditions, won't work under other conditions, whether the kind of equilibrium Adam Smith was describing would exist or not, needed mathematical hard work over the next 200 years. I mean, the theorems about that were being proved by, by 1950 by Kenneth Arrow and Gerard Bento. There's one reason I'm going back, and I don't want to take another few minutes about these earlier times. I feel not just for economics, for research. This is a very, very ex important and exciting time. Research is exciting in itself. I mean, it grips you, it's obsessive. It's like producing art or producing music. It's also extremely important. <laughs> and important now, maybe then, for a very long time. And the reason is something quite specific. I will not go into it, but I have been doing a little bit of work, is any discipline 
the axioms and the assumptions that you write down explicitly. I'm making use of these four assumptions. Those are visible, and the bulk of normal research is to question those axioms, collect data, check if that is correct or not, then change it and reform it and proceed further. But there is a need for a deeper science, and I'm using language from Thomas Kuhn's, uh, uh, Kuhn's uh, uh, science and methodology of science, that that's also fundamental research, and fundamental research has to do with something which is quite interesting. For any discipline, I can speak for economics, there are assumptions that we make which are so much a part and parcel of our thinking, we don't even write that down as an assumption. It's taken for granted. What else can it be? Those are the biggest stumbling blocks. When the world begins to change, like happened during the Industrial Revolution, if you did not discover the hardwired thinking in your head to question them, you would make big mistakes. And I'll give you one example from economics, which falls in that category. Trade and exchange. When will trade and exchange take place? We now know the axiomatic structure. You need preferences to have certain properties. You learned about transitivity, completeness, etc., etc. You need no externalities uh, or properties get um, equilibrium properties get disturbed if there are externalities to your action. You need diminishing returns to scale or concavity of production, etc. We write these down explicitly. If this happens, trade and exchange will take place, and you will have order. One more assumption which is crucial, we never write down, that we can communicate and talk. No book in economics has an axiom with the transitivity and other things saying can communicate. We don't do that. But think of trade and exchange would not occur if we could not communicate with one another. At one level you don't need to write down that as an assumption because that's so true, so much a part and parcel of life that you don't need to write it down, you can take it for granted. But occasionally, the structure of the economy begins to change, or our interaction begins to change. When some of those hidden assumptions, we need to realize that there is that assumption, and the discipline is cracking up, where you need to attend to that assumption, and rethink that if that assumption is working or not working. And in geometry, the biggest example for that comes from geometry, that Euclid did geometry, writing down all the axioms explicitly, one axiom didn't even strike him. He was doing it for a flat surface. Not for a surface like the Earth. It was for a flat surface. That was taken for granted that it's all being done for a flat surface. We are very lucky that before rapid travel began, planes flying across the Earth, it was discovered that Euclid was making one assumption without stating it, the axiom that it's all being done on a plane and non-Euclidean geometry was born out of that. And here, for those who are not economists, I should point out that very often some of these biggest discoveries come from people who are outside the discipline. And the reason is the people in the discipline have their brains already hardwired with those assumptions. And outsiders who get an occasional glimpse, we do know that among the first people who realized that Euclid was using this assumption was Omar Khayyam. He had realized that there was an assumption that Euclid was using without realizing, and then there was a German lawyer, uh, Schweikart, Karl Ferdinand Schweikart, who realized this was being used. He went and told Gauss, and together they began to work on this. With that, let me jump into what I'm talking about now. I'm hoping to cover two sort of topics which are close to mind. One is, both these topics are not from other people's papers and research. Very often, your, some of your most important work will be that. But I thought, given the occasion and given that I'm talking also to students, I will talk about areas where you literally read newspapers and think and try to make sense. Read magazines and try to make sense. And that gives you an occasional topic jumping out. So the first one is um, on group moral responsibility. Right, what is that? Once you get conscious about group moral responsibility and how sloppily we use our language, it's impossible not to read newspapers and listen to news feeling just, gosh, I mean, the, uh, we are not even thinking clearly when we speak about this. And what I mean is when we hold a group responsible morally for something bad or something good, and we use that language all the time. 
in India we use about the people in government, people in the opposition, in the United States, people talk, I've got in my paper long passages, the Democratic Party is bad or the Republican Party is bad. I happen to agree with the second one, but <laughs> these land statements are actually wrong. <coughs> Pause, because the party's behavior or a group's behavior is just like we do in standard game theory, is the outcome of individual behavior, including individual morals and how they translate out into the group's behavior can be very, very different. So individual morality, if you look at the group's behavior, we will think of the individuals as immoral, which need not be the case. You need to understand that. I'm not saying that you go and pardon everyone and everything, but you need to pause and understand this. And one of the primary uh, arguments, which will take me five minutes to put up over here, is a game called Greta's Dilemma. The Greta being a reference to Greta Thunberg, where Greta Thunberg is saying that you must be concerned about future generations. And I will show that if you just learn to be concerned about future generations without paying attention to design and the science of what you do, it can actually backfire on the future generation. That's a tiny little game published in a paper of mine in the journal Synthes, the philosophy journal. I will give that to you. But then I want to go on to do a few other things. So let me begin by giving you the uh, Treat as a starting point the work of a philosopher, Joel Feinberg, in the Journal of Philosophy in 1968. There are a thousand people sunbathing on a beach. When one person begins to drown, and it's a quick incident, within 10 minutes the person drowns and dies. No one gets up. Thousand, each one thinking someone will get up, no one gets up. Who is responsible for this atrocious moral behavior of the group? And Feinberg, I don't even know what country and setting he talks about. He says, by law, now to do it uh, by instead of PowerPoint, by using a board. But this is uh, more than enough for what I need. Most of the time, I use nothing. Thank you very, very much, um, uh, Satosh, for the kind introduction. I was chatting with Uma yesterday about your institute, and thank you to all of you. I don't know who are the people behind the, the plan to invite me, but Amrita was corresponding with me, Parikshit, whoever it was, thank you very much. For me to uh, come to an academic place and give a lecture always feels very special. Uh, I was last week in Ashoka, and I was complaining that I get a lot of invitations from India to talk, but always the topic is the same, prospects of the Indian economy. And there's a limit to how many times you can talk about the prospects of the Indian economy. And given that it's just so full of doubts, I mean, who knows what the prospects are. So coming to an academic place, I decided I'll take advantage of that and give you a talk uh, on based on what I'm currently researching on uh, most of my time. Over the last roughly two and a half years, I will give you a glimpse of some words which have come out last year and some uh, one which is yet to come out. So once again, just thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I enjoy this and it's a pleasure for me to be here. The concern that I'm going to uh, talk about is, is to do with group moral behavior and the need for agreements and conventions in advance. But before that, since your director was talking about ISER and science, as he was speaking, I was remembering um, that there is an interface, a big interface between economics and science. Economics is a very broad discipline, as you know. There are some ends of it which are like humanities. You write in plain English language, even game theorists like uh, Thomas Schelling would not write a single equation, but just clear thinking and literary work. And the other end, there is, of course, completely axiomatic theoretical work. Gerard Debreu is probably the extreme of it. And when when Uma was talking about science, I was remembering one of the early economists who died completely unknown. In fact, in the community of economists, uh, they didn't even know whether he was still alive or not. This is a German economist called Hermann Heinrich Gossen. He had anticipated many of the ideas which would later be discovered by Stanley Jevons, 
by Leon Walras and later Marshall and all. It was there in her, uh, Dawson's work. Dawson had this beautiful line in this work which died unknown during his lifetime, it will be discovered later. He was a sad, tragic character, full of pomposity about his intellectual capacity, but realized that no one was recognizing. In the introduction of the book, he says, I will do for the human sciences what Copernicus did for the stars. So he was reaching out and at one level, staring at the world which Adam Smith was doing and trying to understand what's going on and getting a little bit of understanding of this very, very strange world. And you think for a moment, you step back and you look at trade going on, people producing goods which they won't use themselves for someone else, you wonder, is there a directive coming from the top? And it was at that point of time, a dramatic breakthrough, 1776, for Adam Smith, saying, no, you don't need any central direction for this. It is possible. We can't overdo it that it will happen always under all circumstances. It is possible that individuals going about their <coughs> own chores can bring about a certain order. This is the invisible hand. The invisible hand is descriptively written, overused, misused a lot. But, and to sort of understand that that will work under certain conditions, won't work under other conditions, whether the kind of equilibrium Adam Smith was describing would exist or not, needed mathematical hard work over the next 200 years. I mean, the theorems about that were being proved by, by 1950, by Kenneth Arrow and Gerard Metro. There's one reason I'm going back, and I don't want to take another few minutes about these earlier times. I feel not just for economics, for research. This is a very, very ex important and exciting time. Research is exciting in itself. I mean, it grips you, it's obsessive. It's like producing art or producing music. It's also extremely important. <laughs> and important now, maybe then, for a very long time. And the reason is something quite specific. I will not go into it, but I have been doing a little bit of work, is any discipline the axioms and the assumptions that you write down explicitly. I'm making use of these four assumptions. Those are visible, and the bulk of normal research is to question those axioms, collect data, check if that is correct or not, then change it and reform it and proceed further. But there is a need for a deeper science, and I'm using language from Thomas Kuhn's, uh, uh, Kuhn's uh, uh, science and methodology of science, that that's also fundamental research. And fundamental research has to do with something which is quite interesting. For any discipline, I can speak for economics, there are assumptions that we make, which are so much a part and parcel of our thinking, we don't even write that down as an assumption. It's taken for granted. What else can it be? Those are the biggest stumbling blocks. When the world begins to change, like happened during the Industrial Revolution, if you did not discover the hardwired thinking in your head to question them, you would make big mistakes. And I'll give you one example from economics which falls in that category. Trade and exchange. When will trade and exchange take place? We now know the axiomatic structure. You need preferences to have certain properties. You've learned about transitivity, completeness, etc., etc. You need no externalities uh, or properties get um, Equilibrium properties get disturbed if there are externalities to your action. You need diminishing returns to scale or concavity of production, etc. We like these down explicitly. If this happens, trade and exchange will take place and you will have order. One more assumption which is crucial, we never write down, that we can communicate and talk. No book in economics has an axiom with the transitivity and other things saying can communicate. We don't do that. I think of trade and exchange would not occur if we could not communicate with one another. At one level, you don't need to write down that as an assumption because that's so true, so much a part and parcel of life that you don't need to write it down. You can take it for granted. But occasionally, the structure of the economy begins to change or our interaction begins to change. When some of those hidden assumptions, we need to realize that there is that assumption and the uh, Discipline is cracking up where you need to attend to that assumption and rethink that if that assumption is working or not working. And in geometry, the biggest example for that comes from geometry that Euclid did geometry 
writing down all the axioms explicitly. One axiom didn't even strike him. He was doing it for a flat surface, not for a surface like the earth. It was for a flat surface. That was taken for granted that it's all being done for a flat surface. We are very lucky that before rapid travel began, planes flying across the earth, it was discovered that Euclid was making one assumption without stating it, the axiom that it's all being done on a plane. And non-Euclidean geometry was born out of that. And here, for those who are not economists, I should point out that very often some of these biggest discoveries come from people who are outside the discipline. And the reason is the people in the discipline have their brains already hardwired with those assumptions. And outsiders who get an occasional glimpse, we do know that among the first people who realized that Euclid was using this assumption was Omar Khayyam. He had realized that there was an assumption that Euclid was using without realizing, and then there was a German lawyer, uh, Schweikart, Karl Ferdinand Schweikart, who realized this was being used. He went and told Gauss, and together they began to work on this. With that, let me jump into what I'm talking about now. I'm hoping to cover two sort of topics which are close to mind. One is, both these topics are not from other people's papers and research. Very often, your, some of your most important work will be that. But I thought, given the occasion and given that I'm talking also to students, I will talk about areas where you literally read newspapers and think and try to make sense. Read magazines and try to make sense. And that gives you an occasional topic jumping out. So the first one is um, on group moral responsibility. <laughs> Right, what is that? Once you get conscious about group moral responsibility and how sloppily we use our language, it's impossible not to read newspapers and listen to news feeling just, gosh, I mean, we are not even thinking clearly when we speak about this. And what I mean is when we hold a group responsible morally for something bad or something good, and we use that language all the time. In India, we use about the people in government, people in the opposition, in the United States, people talk. I've got in my paper long passages. The Democratic Party is bad, or the Republican Party is bad. I happen to agree with the second one. But <laughs> these bland statements are actually wrong. You have to pause because the party's behavior or a group's behavior is just like we do in standard game theory, is the outcome of individual behavior, including individual morals and how they translate out into the group's behavior can be very, very different. So individual morality, if you look at the group's behavior, we will think of the individuals as immoral, which need not be the case. You need to understand that. I'm not saying that you want to pardon everyone and everything, but you need to pause and understand this. And one of the... <coughs> Tiny arguments, which will take me five minutes to put up over here, is a game called Greta's Dilemma. The Greta being a reference to Greta Thunberg, where Greta Thunberg is saying that you must be concerned about future generations. And I will show that if you just learn to be concerned about future generations without paying attention to design and the science of what you do, it can actually backfire on the future generation. That's a tiny little game published in a paper of mine in the journal Synthes, the philosophy journal. I will give that to you. But then I want to go on to do a few other things. So let me begin by giving you the, uh, treat as a starting point, the work of a philosopher, Joel Feinberg, in the Journal of Philosophy in 1968. There are a thousand people lying, sunbathing on a beach. When one person begins to drown, and it's a quick incident, within 10 minutes the person drowns and dies. No one gets up. Thousand, each one thinking someone will get up, no one gets up. Who is responsible for this atrocious moral behavior of the group? And Feinberg, I don't even know what country and setting he talks about. He says, by law, no one did it. And he goes on to raise the question. Should we hold these people morally responsible or not? And he then goes on to discuss tort law, saying that there are times in life when you don't hold people morally responsible, but you nevertheless, under the law, you may make them responsible, because that's going to then change their behavior 
in the future. But I'm going to tweak a um, final uh, uh, example, two other examples. Here is one where thousand people are lying on the beach. One person is drowning, but the problem is slightly different. The technology of the world is such that if all thousand get up to help, this person will be safe. If no one gets up to, uh, if anything less than all thousand getting up to help happens, the person will drown. Do you get it? In this case, all thousand will have to do it. The person drowns and goes, no one gets up. Are they morally responsible? Harder question now. Because I can say, what could I have done? It's useless. No one else was getting up. So the person goes, do you hold them morally responsible or not? You can dissect these, consider different definitions of moral responsibility, total moral responsibility, partial moral responsibility. And there is an agenda of that. There are some papers, one by Matthew Graham and Van Hess in Mind, the journal Mind in 2012, which does some kind of a classification of this. These things are important. We hold, hold countries responsible, we hold, hold people's responsible. That language is important. But the larger context, if you get interested, I'll be happy to send you more notes and things that I have, but I want to quickly get down to the little paper I have. Now, individual moral responsibility, I must start with. I, as this is uh, almost confessional, I am sometimes um, uh, uh, as, as a student, I became, uh, am I? I, I became a believer in determinism. Determinism is the belief that ultimately, and this I want to push this aside, uh, human beings do what they do because of their genetic makeup, because of environmental factors. And that, to me, that has to be. That in the end, you and another person may choose differently, but why did you choose differently? Again, if you go back by the causal chain, it, it, causal chain, it will go to something outside of you. So we are determined creatures, just like a billiard ball being tossed and pushed. If that is so, then I'll be morally responsible for our actions. I'm doing what I'm doing because of my genetic makeup, which I did not give to myself, because of my environmental factors, which I did not create to myself. I used to be for a long time a believer that we are not morally responsible for what we do. We may want to hold people responsible and punish them, and I do believe that there's a role to continue to be, because that changes the environment of other people. You get to know that if you behave like this, you'll be punished. That creates a better role, but you don't hold the person morally responsible. On that, I've changed my mind a little bit because of the following thing, that choice, we do have choice, I believe. We have the free will and the ability to choose. Free will, you have to be a bit careful about the word free. We have the ability to choose. Just that, what we will choose is predetermined. So we do choose, and our choice matters, but what we choose is itself predetermined. So, it's a determinist world, but we hold individuals responsible. With that, I'm entering the domain of game. When we write down a game, there are n individuals that we can use as possible. A typical game has three elements to it. You don't even need to write down because the early game theorists, like Thomas Shelley, who never write it down so clearly, but still, you will see. Let me write down a little bit. N is the set of players. One to n individuals. For each player n, <coughs> think of SI as the set of actions available to that player. So it's very simple. You are an individual I. You are thinking what career to choose. Whether you will be a lawyer, an engineer, an economist, a writer, an actor. That's the set of set. SI is all those choices over there. So the choices that you face is a part of this. And I will hold an individual if from based on what you choose, you bring about a dreadful consequence on someone else, you are responsible. So that, I don't want to get into the philosophical debate of are you responsible? Your choice, if you made a bad choice, which you can show led to a dreadful outcome, someone down, you are responsible for that. Like, on that beach, Feinberg's original example where thousand people are lying, 
I would actually hold each one of them all the way responsible. You could have his original story. One person getting up and trying to save would have saved, and no one did. Each one of you is morally responsible. The action was available in your sight. This is the way I'm going to expand the notion of the, a game a little bit to give you my example. Everyone, person one, this is the set of actions available to person one or set of strategies. This is the set of actions available to person two. This is the set of actions available to person N. All the possible outcomes in the world are basically this person chooses something, that person two chooses something, person N chooses something. Once all the choices are made, that's called an outcome. That's the outcome in the world. This is basically the set of all possible outcomes. If you take, for those who do this technically, it's the Cartesian product of these characters is the set of all possible outcomes in the world. And in games, you have payoff functions, I'm putting that back. One additional thing I'm introducing, some of these outcomes are bad and some of these outcomes are good. So, all possible outcomes, this space is I'm partitioning it into good and bad. You can define it into very bad, moderately good, very good, but the outcomes have that. And then I want to see, are there individuals who led the outcome to the bad outcome? Is it an action of yours which would have prevented the outcome from going in over there? Then you are morally responsible. These things can be written down clearly enough, and there's much more work to be done. I want to take an example. Do you have a question? Yes, yeah, go ahead. It may have something to do with their utility functions. In fact, if they typically will, if some people are suffering dreadfully, then I would get that to be bad. But I'm treating the good and the bad, and that you're asking, as primitive. So given the set of outcomes, it's partitioned into the good outcomes and the bad outcomes. The example I will give just now will be making use of utility. Through that, I'm going to break up this into good and bad outcomes. And that by the way, of course, to all, feel free to, uh, I don't know if you feel awkward uh, stopping in a big lecture, but any question, do stop me. As long as I can retain the right not to answer, you're free to ask. So, you ask. Yes, go ahead. So, that, that's where some moral judgment comes out. That if one person dies, I take that to be a bad outcome for the group. Whether the individuals in the group are responsible for that, I have not gone into that yet. I like you can have an example where no matter what I do, that would have happened. Then I'm not responsible. So, but it is to do with the groups leading to a bad outcome or good outcome. How it's the responsibility is, you will just now see with an example. So, okay, hold it for a moment now, and I'm going to construct an example where you may have a problem. What got me interested was the discovery that you can write down very, very simple games where after you persuade individuals to become moral, take into account the fallout on say other individuals, the group will begin to behave morally worse, which immediately shows that by just looking at the group's overall behavior to immediately attribute morals to individuals is a dangerous thing to do. We very often we have to do with that, but we also want to as much as possible to get clarity to the language of this. Fortunately, the United States now there are a bunch of philosophers with a certain amount of game theory who, uh, that they do, beginning to get into this field. And to me, this is a bit like what the prisoner's dilemma told you. That just being individually selfish is not individually good. Over here, you see individually moral may not be morally good for society is where you're going. So let me put up an example. It will become clearer instead of remaining with these abstract numbers. <coughs> I'm going to jam the ball into this because it's sliding here. Perfect. Here is a game that two players play. It's and in case you are not familiar with the equilibrium notion, I will Give, uh, describe an Ash equilibrium. 
But if you're not familiar, don't switch off thinking uh, you won't follow because it's very simple over here, you will be okay. Are you able to see moderately at the back? There are two players. <coughs> player one and player two. Player one set of actions available to player one is A or B. Player one can choose A button. Player two can choose C or B. After they have chosen, they get payoffs. And the payoffs are, in my paper, it was there were dollar incomes, convert them into any currency, users, doesn't matter. If player one chooses A, two chooses C. One gets hundred dollars, two gets hundred and one dollars. In every box, the right hand number is what that person gets, the left hand number is what this person gets. That's the game. If they were just playing this game, what would the outcome be? John Nash would tell you that the equilibrium that he talked about is where the game would settle. The Nash equilibrium in this case is this is deliberately chosen where the Nash equilibrium is also the, the most reasonable thing. I can't see what else can happen. There's one outcome where if both of them choose their actions, no one will want to deviate. For every other outcome pair, someone will say, I, I should have done something else. It can't settle over. Let's just take a look. Where it can settle is, could it settle at AC? Player one choosing A, player two choosing C. It would not settle there. Player one would be able to see that, look, okay, if player two is choosing C, I'll switch over to B. Pick up an additional dollar. It could never settle there. Could it settle here? I'm choosing B, the other person is choosing C. The other person will switch over to D. This would go here. The other person will pick up 101 instead of 100. There's only one outcome which is stable or is an equilibrium where you can settle on. That's this one. No one will want to move. I'll be worse off. I'll be worse off. No one will want to move. Now, Greta Thunberg arrives, these are the players, and says that, look, you're playing this game, thinking of your own payoffs. You realize that what you do has an effect on bystanders. And the bystanders could be poor people who live on the fringes of society, whose actions have very little consequences for others, but they do get affected by, by what these rich people do. Or the bystanders could be people in a future generation, uh, 100 years ago. Uh, 200 years later, who get the fallout of what we are doing now. And so I'm going to elaborate the game a little bit by calling it, this is a game, describing a society I call it, where you have a game, but you also have the bystanders payoff. This box is going to show you what the bystander gets as a consequence of what the players do, and the payoffs are, these are all hooked up to give me easy solution. This is what the future people, or the poor living on the margins of society, get as a consequence of the, what these people do. So these actions are still what those people are doing. If player one does A, player two does C, this player gets two, etc. Is it clear that what a society means? A society has the players playing a game and bystanders who get the fallout of this game. Now look at what happens to the bystander who's very poor is when these people play the game completely selfishly, the bystander ends up with four. And this is where Greta Thunberg comes and says that, look, for you people, it's $100 or $101. You're just very, very well off. Whereas the bystanders are very badly off. Just to sacrifice $1 for the sake of a bystander is something that you should do. And player one gets persuaded by Greta that I had to take the bystanders well-being into account. So what happens is that the game gets transformed where player one is now saying, no, for whatever I do, I will treat a dollar earned by, a by, by the bystander like my dollar. The other rich person I'm not worried about, 
or the bystander's dollar is like my dollar. If you want, you can make the bystander's dollar as half of my dollar. Lots of variants possible, but I'm assuming that when you're persuaded by Greta, you say that no, a future generation or a poor person, one dollar is like my one dollar. I'm willing to sacrifice one dollar if that person is getting two dollars. Once a person becomes moral, player one becomes moral, this game transforms into another game. Do you see this? AC is now 100 plus you're internalizing this. So you're treating this outcome as I'm getting. It's like my getting 102. And this becomes and this becomes the same as before because zero. And this becomes The game has not changed because person one is now persuaded that you are taking into account the fallout of my actions on a bystander. Where will the game end up when you become moral? Earlier you were sitting here and now you will say, no, no, I can't be here. Just by this move, the other person gets so much. You jump there. But if you are jumping there, the other person will jump here. Keep going around this, you will find that there's only one place society will settle down. This is where it will settle down. And after person one becomes moral, thinking about the bystander, the bystander gets a real sock. The welfare goes down. That is what I call Greta's dilemma. And it's not just one person going moral. I mean, these are now, they look trivial, but I have to say for me it was great fun playing around with these numbers, creating these examples. Even if a whole society goes moral, you can create games where it's going to backfire <coughs> on the people you're being moral about. Which means, all of us here, mechanism design, how you do it, restructuring of the game, those things begin to matter a lot. And this has the larger lesson that the moral intention, I do believe, is very important. I feel over and above our own self-interest, a certain moral coding is crucial for a society to function. There are certain things I just won't do because it's wrong to do, etc. But in addition to that, you do need science to understand that just mechanically hardwiring ourselves with this intention is not good enough. There are situations where that can backfire, just like that backfires in the prisoner's dilemma. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, and I do want to give you a little bit of my other example, but three, four minutes on where do we go from here, and there's a bit of a philosophical puzzle which interests me a lot. When you get examples of this kind, something bad happening in a game, and you can take it also in climate change. For a long time, you would each country does well for itself. Soon you realize that does not work. The prisoner's dilemma is there. If every country is thinking selfishly, the world collectively will cause a climate disaster then you step out and say that we have to have a collective position. We have to get together, have meetings, etc. Then there is a philosophical problem. I will touch on it. Yes. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I'm, once this person becomes moral, I'm taking the new situation to be a game again. <coughs> And a game is where both people's payoff functions are common knowledge. Correct. That's a very good thought. So, if you can go moral, but advertise to the world that you are as selfish as you were in the past, actually he's right, that would work very well over here. And I have gone all the way to a standard game where the payoff functions in the end are common knowledge. So you can pause and reconstruct these with partial knowledge is there. One is, of course, to go the way of you could be this or you could be something else, Bayesian game. But I feel this thing about whether we know what you know and what you know about us, there are deep philosophical problems over there, but it is true. I'm using mechanically that once your payoff function changes, it becomes common knowledge. Yeah, I wasn't making that assumption. Okay. Um, no, yeah. 
yeah. sir i would like to ask that uh, why would the uh, future uh, uh, generation get uh, Because it's not coming from anything empirical. It's showing if that happened, you'll get into a strange result. I was just picking numbers to show that if these numbers happen, you'll get a strange result, which is just alerting you that when we see a group behaving immorally, we say that they are immoral, it will be exactly the opposite. Someone has become moral, so it backfires. So it's uh, just an example to alert you that there may be more. How much more there will be empirically, how relevant this is, I really don't know. I suspect it is quite relevant, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. See, there's one point I'll make and I'll leave it aside. Usually in economics, what we do is when you're doing a, an analyzing a game, you treat that as a game of life. The term game of life comes from Ken Winmore, who used to be my maths teacher in the London School of Economics before he switched over to economics and now he's morphing into philosophy and then more keeps changing his positions. He described the game of life and says that consider something as the game of life. What is the game of life? The game of life is literally everything put together in the world, the world, the way it is. We are currently playing the game of life. I'm choosing whether to give a lecture or not, then I'll decide whether to go for a walk or not. You people are deciding whatever you decide. If you describe everything, and I think it was uh, uh, was it uh, Andy Postlewaite or someone who says whatever is allowed by the laws of nature, by the laws of physics. If you take all that is allowed, that huge big game is the game of life, and then you analyze it. One problem with the game of life is I'm not completely convinced that there is no such thing as the game of life. And for the reason that since there is, um, I know there's a, people who do maths over here. In early mathematics, you would very often start with the set of everything. You consider the set of everything and then you do your analysis. Bertrand Russell bumped into a paradox. That is a strange paradox. Couldn't understand and then he realized that the set of everything is a meaningless thing. There is no such thing as a set of everything. Likewise, I don't think there is anything called the set of uh, a game of life. A game of life is a convention among game theorists that we will analyze this and restrict our game to this. But when you bump into a problem like this, you need to step out of that convention and say that we need prior agreements, we need conventions. And prior agreements to me are set value Nash equilibria. It's a group of people who have decided that we will not do certain actions. That's a constitutions, that certain actions we will never undertake. If you can exclude actions in a way so that what remains is collectively a sort of set value Nash equilibrium, then that is what a constitution is. And we have to think in terms of, in order to create a better world, set value constitutions and agreements. I want to hold this aside and get into my next example because I'm running short of uh, time. And we'll come back to this debate. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Also mean that uh, Greta should maybe go quiet revolution and not talk much about it, but just go along one and try to change behavior of some without having these big talks. And so yes, I like it just that you've now brought in Greta as yet another player into the game, and you that may be right that Greta also should strategize better and go and whisper into this person's ear and take a cue that you become moral. And once you become moral, don't let the other person know. So yes, and this is what the uh, game of life problem is. You can bring Greta as a player, and then you can bring others as a player. It becomes larger and larger, and newer solutions begin to appear. And we have to go that route. But I, I was not going there. But uh, your preference will get revealed. Yeah, so I mean, you know, Nash never makes us very clear. Nash's writings are so brief, you don't know. 
the pair function that are treated as common knowledge. So how they become common knowledge, whether it is through repeated thinking or just through thinking, we don't know, we treat it as common knowledge. I want to just get into a field which is now of great interest to me, is a very, very uh, practical thing. Again, you look at the world, why authoritarian leaders get worse over time. Hard data on this I do not have. But when I look at it, the most recent example is that one authoritarian leader whom I met and had discussions with, uh, Daniel Ortega, who was once a noble revolutionary, uh, overthrowing some of that dreadful regime, and now has morphed into something grotesque in the way some of that was what happened during this time. And there are other examples in the world, actually when I began working on this, I was thinking of Putin, who's been in the news a lot. Putin was never a golden person who changes into this. But if you read some of his early career, Putin is almost like anyone else. He was very early in the KGB, a bit of a street ruffian. At the same time, early assessments of Putin says he has no taste for personal luxury and wealth. There are these Russian documents. He, as a person who likes to live simply with a certain ambition, so a nice description. He was once, as you all know, he did a PhD uh, from Leningrad and like any other student, 150 page PhD. Now we do know that 15 pages of that PhD was straight lifted from an American textbook, but only 15 pages for current Putin is a pretty good record. And now he would have taken the whole thing out of someone else and not wasted any time. So it's more. What is it that is happening? over here and how do you stop it? I don't think I'll get it. First of all, I have no clear answer how do you stop it. But then I did want to talk about conventions and prior agreements playing a very, very important role and we are at a stage in the world where we need to put our minds together. But I want to explain to you because I got quite excited when it struck me why dictators, uh, authoritarian leaders tend to get worse over time and I want to use the last 10 minutes to give you a glimpse of this. At 11 o'clock we will have to stop. Yes. And can I, after that, go on for five minutes or so? No, I don't want to cut into the next session. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, then I might take five minutes of the coffee break off. Uh, <laughs> let me show you now why my belief now is the reason why authoritarian leaders get worse over time has a very, very almost trivial explanation. And some of the life's biggest, most dramatic things often have roots in very simple ordinary thinking. And the analogy of this thinking is the same reason why George Akerlof had not made a parcel to students when he was living in India and had postponed it over three months. I, I might come to that analogy later, but let me explain the thinking typically of an authoritarian leader. You are in office. So start from a period when this leader is in office for the first time, let us say, and is trying to decide whether to strive to stay on in office in power for one more term or not. For that, the typical calculation that you would think of will look like this. If you do stay in office, let's say the utility from being in power, utility from being in office is x. If you are thrown out of office, you lose power. Utility from being out of office. Of course, you wouldn't try to stay in office if it worked out like this. That x is given in y, so I will assume it's a given in y. Now, we have to decide how much will you work and indulge in political intrigue. I'm thinking of bad actions in order to stay in office. Politicians, this is around the world. They strategize, they decide how much you will foster life of ethical behavior in order to stay in office. And that range of behavior that you're choosing from, in order to keep that analysis simple, you're choosing an E. E equal to zero means you don't do anything bad. E is sort of evil action. It's a good way to remember it. E is evil action or political intrigue. 
Zero, no, I won't do anything. One is just dreadful, the things that you're doing. And that means that you're choosing the scheme in order to maximize the probability of staying in office. So I'm assuming now that that's the probability of being in office. The higher the E, the greater probability that you will be in office. And the E does cause you some problem. E is political intake. So there's some morality in us, I'm assuming. So R, let us say, R is how much remorse you feel for indulging in this evil. And I'm going to assume R is a function of E. And let me make R0 equal to 0. If you do not indulge in any evil, you feel no remorse. Apart beyond that, it increases and it increases at an increasing rate. I also want the solution to have uh, the equations to have a solution. Increases at an increasing rate. Given this, the uh, uh, dictator's problem is very easy to see. The dictator's aim is to maximize. You see, that's the dictator's problem. You're choosing E to maximize the expected pair of here by sign. I'm going to make the problem even simpler for me. The probability of being uh, in office, I'll make that equal to E. So E goes from 0 to 1. The probability is that. If we do that, then this equation becomes even simpler. Let's save me a little bit of space. This is what you are trying to maximize, and you are going to finally get a solution. What would that look like? Uh, that's going to look like this equation. Now, I put this equation slightly differently, and you'll see it in a picture very, very well. This maximum could be written as x minus y plus y minus i. Exactly. Uh, this equation could be written in this manner, which means the optimization here looks like this in a picture. <coughs> this, take it up to here, it's a line which, when e is equal to zero, it's at y, and then it goes up to x. This is the line e x minus y plus y and r e goes like this. And you are trying to maximize the gap between these two. That's the e star. You choose that much even to stay on the power. You've done your calculation, you've been done in this, you've stayed on the power. One mistake that this calculation has, I purposely hit the mistake, and <clears throat> is because it's so natural, we would do it, and I think leaders do it, and George Akarov did it in playing the parcel. One important element of thinking is not in there. If I do stay in power after indulging in this activity, I've indulged in this evil, I've stayed on in power. Next round, what will my calculation be? One thing that you have to take into account is your exit option gets worse as you stayed in power and indulged in evil. Because when you go to community college to trial, which means what you get when you're out of office right now as why, but once you've indulged in the E, it gets worse. So what you can say is that next period in T plus one y t plus 1 is a function of the e in period t. How much record of bad behavior you are keeping in office affects that. And as f in, as e increases, the outside option gets worse. Once you do that, a dynamic begins to play over here, where you are set on the path of becoming worse and worse. And you may, if you are clear headed enough, you may regret. Putin may be stamping now and saying, gosh, I shouldn't have done what I did in 
2002, I had no way out. But it is a dynamic inconsistency. Should we uh, stop now or not? Okay, okay, it's a serious one. So, okay, clock is ticking. ticking, so I can take another half minute. Actually, I will, after that, I will take literally five minutes because I want to open up that uh, discussion given just the kind of outcome that you will see over here. What is it that we can do? We live in a globalized world. I feel a lot of the agreements now have to be global agreements and understanding. We will have to do that. I have no clear solution, but I think a lot of it is to do with conventions and prior agreements. I do and stop. Now let me stop anyway. Of that leader, even that leader, uh, which will then be a successful legacy for the first two yes. years, then this might change. So, you know, uh, the way I've done this, the model is a little bit more in the paper, a little bit more than what I'm showing over here for the class. But I keep it very, very streamlined without any of those things. What you can do is bring in additional things that as the thing is changing. Your performance is also changing. Your uh, your or there can be two variables you're choosing. One is the how, how, how much political intrigue you indulge in, and how much work you do for a better economy, better society. That's another dimension you're choosing, and both begin to play a role. If you do that, it's going to be a more elaborate model. But again, in the core of it, this particular logic is still sitting there. That um, if you are being a bit short-sighted about what the exit option will be in the next three years, then you will still get in. But yes, the model is going to get more complicated and uh, and we will also get differences. Uh, different people with different mindsets, political leaders, will play the game differently in this. And the analogy which I was going to give and I paused was, this is what actually happened to George Ackerlock when he and Joseph Stiglitz uh, came to, uh, uh, soon after college. Early years came to ISI Delhi to spend some time uh, when um, uh, um, Stiglitz was leaving, Stiglitz gave a parcel to George Akerlof. They were very close friends. Say, can you mail it to me? It's too much baggage for me. And Akerlof said, I took it very happily. He's a dear friend. And next morning, he got up in Delhi and he said, you know, the cost of carrying it to the post office, the queue over there seemed a bit big. So I decided I'm going to send it tomorrow, not today. So he didn't do it that day. He kept it for next day. And he said that Stiglitz won't mind one day's today. Next day he woke up and went through the same calculation that it's seeming too painful now. And in psychology, there's a term called salience that the cost now looms larger in our head than if we thought of it objectively about tomorrow. So it's the salience that kicks in. Again, Adam or not send it the second day, third day. I think he sent it after three months or something like that. <laughs> the logic is very similar. I think the games also do behavioral economics, it's dynamic inconsistency. But we are very prone to that. I mean, I think I'm prone to that, I'm aware of that, most of us are prone to that. And this is we really very often, and some people would say it's too tiny a description of a dreadful uh, leader. But human beings are victims of their own thought, etc. So at one level, it would be very trivial miscalculation. It sends you tumbling on that loop. Daniel Ortega is a great example. I mean, the first round when he was in power, it was decent enough. Then he comes back, second time, it begins. And I think now he can't afford to exit anymore of the past. It's absolute desperation to cling to power by doing anything to anyone. He needs to stay on. That's the logic that's being conveyed over here. Let me not go in. If you make it into a TPM model, you will see that it will be E1, E2, E3, E3. It's going to just increase over time, and in the end, you're getting very little by staying in power. You may even regret your initial decisions, but it's too late. What do you do about uh, a problem of this kind? I sincerely believe that it sounds too idealistic, but we've come a very great way by in terms of novel policy design, interventions. What the world needs now is something like term limit, for instance. may have to be a global term limit. That the United Nations will get involved if one country violates the term limit conditions. Because it's such an interconnected world that bad behavior and this spills over very easily into another. You have to think in terms of contracts and conventions in advance to lock ourselves into a certain kind of better behavior. 
and regulations which now look completely normal to us, which if you think of the industrial revolution period, when there were new laws coming in, new regulations, that time the income tax came in for the first time in 1942, sorry, 1842 in Britain. Now income tax seems standard. How will a government run provide public goods without income tax? But when that happened, it was considered an outrageous thing that was happening. But it was the mixture of phenomenal thinking from Adam Smith to David Ricardo, Augustine Kuno, who's basically giving us our modern antitrust legislation, the Sherman Act is coming out of a lot of the early thinking of uh, how oligopolies function. This marrying of the intellect with the moral intention is absolutely crucial at the juncture because we are a bit of a similar juncture as the world and we very often get angry and big responsibilities on individuals. Of course there are individuals who are responsible. But beyond that, there is a collective agenda where research is a great way to enter this large collective agenda that the world faces. Let me not keep you from your coffee anymore. Thank you very much. In, in this discussion, if we were to witness e, evil behavior with e, good behavior, the logic will still go through, right? That will go through exactly. The equation will flip over. So the G, the higher the evil, the lower the G. So it will be just going the other way around. So if you're trying to choose good behavior, it will be exactly this in reverse. But I was taking this question to be a bit more. That apart from the political intrigue, there are other things that you're doing also when you're in office. Just a part of your mind is on the work that you do for the prosperity and economy. And that can be brought in as another dimension. It's going to give you a broader model. And there may be interesting results out there. But I think this particular result is going to survive the addition of that reality. But flipping E to G is going to uh, flip your first derivatives the other way. And I think you get the same result as my expectation. Yeah. Okay. Sir, what about those people who do evil act, but uh, those people do not have any remorse. Let's think about narcissism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that is there. Uh, who feel no remorse? Yeah, right from the start, you better keep those people out. <laughs> <laughs> what they are in, there's no mechanism in there. Uh, and, and there are people of that kind. And also, there are also people that in between the two who, after they've done it, you brainwash yourself that you've done it for the good of something. It's very easy to do. The evil you did to stay in power now becomes brainwashed in your own head that it was for the larger good of society. So yes, unfortunately, these are very, very troubling questions and we have to navigate the world with that. And like any of these problems, uh, even if we get to a better crafting of re regulation to prevent such people, no foolproof better. Life has that risk, someone comes in and <laughs> there one again hopes, uh, uh, it sounds like a, a, a preachy lecture. But in our heads also, a little bit of moral hardwiring, and I'm not referring to religious and beliefs and text, moral hardwiring about honesty, integrity, kindness, compassion. I think these things play an important role. And I think every time I say this, I cite one of the greatest theorists of the last 100 years. To my mind, actually, the most creative theorist, Ken Arrow, uh, Arrow's theorem and social choice theory and breakthroughs in uh, generally equality. Arrow had a paper in 1973 where he says that just he is the person who finally formalizes Adam Smith's invisible hand. Almost 200 years later, a formal theorem, Arrow and Debro. But he says if it was just selfishness, the modern society would not last for 10 minutes without the nuts and bolts of little bits of moral consciences that we have. It would not run. And I think there's something to that. We don't model it. But fortunately, again, in America, there's now a small group of philosophers beginning to come into this using a little bit of game theory. I think this is an agenda that is opening up. Any of you here, PPE, which is a big thing in uh, England, of course, but in America, philosophy, politics, and economics is now an inter-university effort of people from different places coming together, discussing this, <laughs> and once a year, it's becoming a big agenda. Just a hypothetical question. Yes. Had Trump won the second time, he would have gone into this curve, I believe. But how did the society fix? Yeah. yeah. It was uh, Trump would have been exactly this. Or him exit then would be impossible. It's already very difficult his exit. It would be impossible and he'd do anything to stay on. I think society, the OA and luck also comes in. 
I mean, January 6th was touch and go. If, if he had not control of that, he would have bulldozed and stayed in power, and then election results would even <coughs> So it was lucky. It's also, I suppose, that's why I'm saying at one level, be basic, ordinary people have a responsibility because you keep the human beings understanding in America. Understanding is very mixed, it's a very polarized society now. But a little bit, some people understanding, and a lot of luck kept Trump out. So finally, I just wanted to say. I heard this lecture 50 years ago, I would have done economics. I don't mind the expression, otherwise we can the chat outside as you wish. So I think, I think uh, we should stop here uh, because it should be 15 minutes for talking. So we can chat outside with coaching. Uh, please wait. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful lecture. And now I request Professor Sandosh Panda to please hand over a commando to Professor Koshik Bissell as a token of her love and respect.